Amen. Thank you. So tonight we are going to look at John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. It's a very familiar passage. And so as we always do, we will try and uh, just um, share some of the ideas or thoughts that will come into our minds that we know that we uh, can have an interactive discussion so that we can all benefit from this you know, passage. So just before I read the introduction, I want you to turn with me to John chapter 1. And I'm going to read from verse 1 through verse 18. The Gospel of John chapter 1, reading from verse 1 through verse 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that might that all might believe through him. He was not a light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Praise God for that. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Beautiful, powerful words from Scripture. So let me read the introduction and then I will open up the floor for discussion. As we always do, you got the outline, the handout. So just follow me in just the introductory paragraph there. The word became flesh and dwelled among us so that we might have grace and truth. Those two words, as you know, were repeated over and over in the scripture reading. Grace and truth and light. Not only did Jesus come for the sake of our salvation, but also as an example. Jesus came to show us who God is and to make a way for us to know God personally. He came that we might have life in him. We who belong to Jesus are called to go into this world to dwell amongst people who don't know God's grace and truth. We are to live incarnationally. That's a beautiful word there, because that's what Jesus did. As it were, to go into the world as those sent on mission to reach those around us with the grace and truth of the gospel. This is our calling, and we see it embodied in our Savior. Because the word was made flesh, we can be saved and share this good news with others so that they too might come to believe and receive eternal life. So, let me ask you, what is it that really jumps at you or 
that sticks out in this passage that we've read and also in the introduction, something that you would like to share with us. Who and what is Jesus to you? And what is the author, John, trying to convey to us about the word that became flesh, that incarnated something that we are called to also do? What is it that we'd like to share? Please, if you can use the... Yes, thank you, Mom. <laughs> I know we don't feel comfortable, but it's good so that uh, we can hear your voice. There you go. It's not coming on? There's not a little thing there. You, you push it at the bottom. There you go. No, it's on. She got it. Okay. Um, my thought was it starts out in the beginning, uh -huh. just like Genesis. Yes. So it tells you God's always been. Yeah. 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 So the word beginning is really important. And so in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, in the beginning, God created. And so this same God that we read about in Genesis is the same God that we read about in John chapter 1. In this case, we see him being described as the word. The word was in the beginning, the logos. We'll talk a little bit about that. But you're right. So this is the author's way of saying, just as you see God in the beginning of creation, you see Jesus as God. Also, really, at the creation. He was there even before creation came about. And that's really important. Now, what does that tell us? If he was there at the beginning, in fact, nothing came, you know, without him, then really something is important here for us to understand. In the beginning, was the word and the word was with God and then John you know that capstone and the word was God that's God from the beginning that's a good one any other thoughts any other thoughts about this passage yes and Marilyn um, it's more a rhetorical but um, sure some people say they don't even believe the Old Testament how can they Believe the, uh, believe the New Testament without the Old Testament because the New Testament brings up creation. It brings, you know. Right. Um, brings it's a good up, question. Yeah. So yeah. some people have put the Old Testament aside and just only believe the t New Testament. I don't understand that. Right. <laughs> and, and that's a good question because um, you're right that even, you know, the, the Jews who obviously, we know, Jesus emerged out of the, you know, Judaism. Uh, they, they, they claim or take the Old Testament as the Hebrew Bible, the Jewish Bible, and uh, they don't actually uh, believe in Jesus. So the New Testament doesn't make any sense you know, to them, except the Messianic Jews who obviously have come to embrace you know, Jesus. But you know, as believers, if, I have, if I, I have a board here, I will just show you. We know that the two halves of the Bible are all connected. And so if you take the cross... If you look at my hand here, you have the cross. You have the Old Testament here. And you have the New Testament. And the cross we know symbolizes Jesus Christ. And so the Old Testament precedes Jesus Christ, anticipates Jesus Christ. And then the New Testament follows Jesus and proclaims Jesus. And so we see that in Jesus, embodied in Jesus, are the two halves of the Old Testament and the New Testament together. So you're right. How come that some people don't see Jesus in the Old Testament? They don't, you know, and some will even go to the extent of saying, well, you know what? The Old Testament God was somebody that they call, let me spell that word, it's pronounced Demiurge, D-E-M-I-U-R-G. This is an evil, vengeful God. A God who will just, shh, when you sin, and when you go to the New Testament, you see a gracious God, a God who is so kind. And Well, from what I know, the God who is in the New Testament is the same God who is in the Old Testament. And so, yes, those kind of things have been suggested. But we know that it's all because of lack of understanding and appreciation of the Bible. And that's why we're here, to study and to be able to understand so that we can share this with others and kind of try and 
and, and correct that, that uh, you know, view or misunderstanding. So you're right. There's that problem. Yes, no, Sandy. Um, I have heard people explain to me that they didn't like the Old Testament for yeah. the reasons that you just said. That's correct. God was ruthless. God yeah. had no compassion. Yeah. They didn't feel the love. Right. Whereas the New Testament, they right. felt nothing but. Right. But I look at it as... The Old Testament, we are learning yep. as Christians about God uh -huh. and what his power is, right. what his plan uh -huh. is. And he made statements that if you do this, uh -huh. this is going to happen. Right. If you turn around, right. you're going to become a pillar uh -huh. of salt. Right. If you don't do this, I'm going to destroy you. Right. And I don't see how God could have said those things and not done them for us right. to understand and believe his power and his goodness and his understanding and the way he predicts. Right. And he, one of the questions I've been reading with a friend, Mere Christianity, yeah. and one of the mm -hmm. questions was, was about God and how he is always in our life. Right. And what he says, he does. We can trust. Mm -hmm. We can be a part of. Mm -hmm. We can depend on. Right. And I think that is really the beauty and basis of the Old Testament. Right. That God is exhibiting his power, right. his word, mm -hmm. and the things that we can and cannot do. Right. I mean, it, yeah. if, he, if he said, okay, if you look back, you're going to become a pillar of salt, and she didn't, right. how would we know? Yeah. How would we know mm -hmm. what was true and right. untrue? Right. He had no choice but to... Sure to do as he told us. And that is absolutely no correct. Let me also add to what you just said. Uh, and there's a word that you use there, that in the Old Testament we are learning about God, and also we're learning that through how God related to the people of Israel. Let me give you an, an example of Genesis chapter 22, where you read about God asking Abraham to go and sacrifice. And you notice that God stayed Abraham's hand. You know, so could that be child, you know, kind of commutation, you know, killing children? Look, Abraham came from a very pagan, uh, you know, uh, a polistic culture. That is a, a culture in which they worship multiple gods and they killed and, you know, child sacrifice and all of that. And also, the whole five books of the Bible, the first five books, we call them the Torah, the law. But actually what it means is that instruction, guidance. That's really what the word. God was instructing and guiding Israel, trying to educate them. Just as you, know, you have a little child and you go to educate the child, you go to tell them what is right and wrong because they look at you and they take their cues from you. So Israel was just like that. And God was trying to, you know, so there are several things that we can learn from the Old Testament. And God why did they have to go 40 years to get to the promised land? They could have done that, you know, not too long a distance. But through all those, you know, stations in the wilderness, God was educating and teaching them. In fact, we can take an, you know, a lesson from that. God is doing the same for us. And so the God of the Old Testament is the same God who came and took the, you know, the 12 disciples Look at how much they messed up. Peter, you know, Lord. And yet God was educating all of them. They all abandoned Jesus. They all abandoned God. You know, Mark chapter 14, verse 51. All of them fled. And Jesus was alone. You can kind of, you know, extrapolate on that. The same thing that you see in the Old Testament. And yet Jesus was there for them. And so at the end, they reconvened. Meet me on Mount, you know, on this mountain in Galilee. There, I will meet you. 
God doesn't abandon us. Even in our sinfulness, even in the sinfulness of the people of Israel, God was still with them. And God took them through the prophets and all of that to educate them. So that's the way we got to understand the Old Testament. But you're right. Some people don't under, see it that way. So they say, oh, he is a very wrathful, very vengeful a God who just kills you or asks people to go kill the Amalekites, destroy cattle, children, women. Hey, the Geneva Convention says even in war, you don't kill women and children. So what is this God? We don't, un, you know, people don't understand that this is really not how God actually works. And so it's just our lack of understanding. That brings that about. But that's a good point. That's a really good point. Any other thoughts? Yes. Yeah, always uh, my testimony. Sure. That because I didn't believe Jesus Christ uh, is God, you know, right. I rejected. But uh, because I, I said, if there is God, show me. Mm -hmm. That's why Lord came. And I met him, I saw him. Right. And when I saw him, I understood what's the meaning of God. I right. never ever right. <laughs> even think about God mm -hmm. and his holiness. Right. I never understood what's the meaning of holy. Right. But when I saw Jesus Christ, I couldn't believe what's the meaning of holiness. I, I cannot even express because holiness, it means sinless. Right. If you are standing right front of God who is Sinless. Right. Thank God because Jesus came to me as right. like a human form. Mm -hmm. If he came like a glorious form, I, I, I could be dead. But because of his kindness, mm -hmm. uh, he came like a human form. But right. even though I saw his eyes, I could read like a Bible, right. the word of God. I never understood the Bible. But when I met him, I understood so many things. I never have uh, understood this word of God because I didn't believe it. No. But when I met Jesus Christ, I understood the Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. He is God and he is the maker of you and me. Yeah. His love we cannot compare as like a parents and no. child love. No. He's beyond. No. That is approval on the cross. Because I cannot die for my daughter. Oh. Really, really. Sure. But Jesus Christ did for us. That's right. He died for us, that cruel mm -hmm. cross. That is proven his love. So I don't know how to express his love. So right. the creation started from Jesus Christ. We are made by his form. Right. Form of Jesus Christ. That's right. That's why the end Jesus Christ will come to save us Amen. from the evil hand. Mm -hmm. So right. he is the, our uh, savior. Right. We are calling him Messiah. Amen. Thank you. In, in fact, on that note, I think uh, on the first point, uh, we see from John's gospel, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18, that Jesus is the creative agent. He's the one who made everything. So among Jesus' first creative acts was calling light into existence. Soon followed by placing the heavenly lights of the sun, the moon, the stars in the sky to govern the timing of the, you know, the light. And then, but for the creation, before the creation of the light, the word who is the light shown as the source of life. In other words, Jesus is the creator and Jesus is is also the source of every. In fact, we owe our lives to him. Uh, and so in, uh, in John chapter um, 1 and um, verse uh, 9, you can see the true light which gives light to everyone was coming to the world. And then in uh, verse 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And then verse 3, which is uh, uh, um, John 1, 3, that looks like a dollar in your uh, outline. I think there was a typing error there. It says, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So John 1, 3, 
John 1, 9. And then, of course, uh, when we go to John chapter 14 and verse 6, let me read that to your hearing again. John 14 and verse 6, uh, we read, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So your life, my life, as you rather said, you know, are all uh, hidden in Jesus Christ. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so we owe our physical existence to Jesus Christ. And therefore, that brings me to that to our next paragraph under number one, the third paragraph there. Trying to make sense of our lives and our purpose apart from Christ is futile. And that's what most people try to do. We try to understand what is my meaning? What is my mission here? Why am I here? And, uh, you know, we try to understand that apart from Jesus Christ. But you see, tonight, because of Jesus Christ, we have this confidence to know that our life or your life fulfills its ultimate meaning and purpose only in relationship to Jesus Christ and his design for your life and for my life. Why? Because he is your creator and he's my creator. You know, this is something that the world misses and the world doesn't know. Let me just propose to you, submit to you tonight that the reason why we have so much evil and so much confusion in our world today is because we don't allow God to be the creator and us as God's creation. We blurred out those lines of distinction or demarcation. You know, when the devil went to uh, Adam and Eve, the implication was that you are little gods. You know, did God say you will surely die? No, 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 you will not do that. You see, he insidiously tried to plant something that was not true in their minds, and they fell for it. And that's what's going on in our world. We think we are little gods. We think we can do it, you know, because of all the technological advancement. But, you know, technology fails. I don't know about you, but sometimes my computer drives me crazy. <laughs> you think you got it all typed, and you know, then you lose that text. You don't even know where it is. And no matter what you do, you know, uh, it, it's, you know, I will tell you, I had a, a, a scare in my life. I was doing my doctoral dissertation, and I'd written a chapter that, and then it just disappeared. And I didn't know where, you know, they, thank God somebody was clever than I was and he was able to get it for me. You know, that's how it is. Because, yes, all our iPhones and everything, very smart. But, the, you know, there comes a point where it just stops there. But yes, go ahead. Why is it called the word? Huh. Right. Why is Jesus called the Word? It's very interesting. I think we can hazard some guesses here. I mean, the author wrote in the Greek context. So the word logos, which is the Greek, well, that is used. But isn't it, isn't, it, you know, isn't it interesting that it was through God's Word that things what came about? He spoke the word and the world came into what? Being. He spoke the word and the world came into being. So if Jesus is the word, to me that speaks volumes. In fact, not only is he just the mere word or even the message, if you like, is in there. He is the word and he's the one who speaks the word and the word is creative. The word of God is creative. And so in the word of God, we are recreated, made new, renewed every day. And that's one thing that I take from this word, word. God spoke and he came into being. And Jesus speaks life to you and to me. And that's what Jesus did. In his miracles, he just spoke. Get up, take up your mat and walk. Leaping, jumping and leaping, and we talked about it, and praising God, that they man. And so I think even when you take that 
you know, term, word from the Greek you know, context, logos, it still makes you know, sense that God in Genesis spoke creation into being from nothing. And that's what Jesus is. And to me, that again proves that Jesus is God. Because Jesus did exactly what the Old Testament God, if you like, who is the same God, you know, did during the time of creation. Does that make sense? I believe that. And so, you know, you can see for those who don't even believe the Old Testament God, and you, you can see the kind of similarity and complementarity and all of that. He's the same God because he speaks. In fact, again, we, are, we know in John's Gospel, the I am sayings, another testimony, evidence of God. Because in, in Exodus, and we, we know this, but it's always good to refresh ourselves uh, when we, in Exodus chapter 3, when God called Moses to go and, um, you know, bring Israel uh, out of Egyptian bondage. Look at verse 13 of uh, Exodus chapter 3, uh, verse 13 going. Let me read that. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, I'm reading from Exodus chapter 3, verse uh, 13, and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they, that is the people, ask me, that is Moses, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God gives the answer in verse 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. Period. We find the same title for Jesus Christ. We just read one of them. John chapter 14, verse 6. I just read one of that you know, to you right away. And what does that you know, say? Jesus says something there. Let me go back and you know, read it again. In John 14 and verse 6, I am the way. I am. In fact, another one that is interesting is uh, chapter 11. And verse 20, there's several of them, about eight I am's, but just because of time. In John chapter 11, where Jesus actually brings uh, Lazarus back to life, uh, we find it in uh, uh, verse uh, 20, uh, um, uh, you know, 25. Let me see if I can find that for you. John chapter 11 and verse 25, Jesus said to her, this is, you know, Jesus in the context of Mary and Martha weeping over the death of their brother Lazarus. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Do I? Do you believe this? And so you see, Jesus took that name because he is the I am. And he tells us in John chapter 10, I am the good shepherd. You know, so Jesus is really the God of the Old Testament because he takes that name. And he doesn't arrogate that name to himself. He is that name because he is God in verity. And so I think there's that evidence for us to even see. You know, people don't want to believe and they will come up with all kinds of things why they don't want to believe. And I always say to my students when I, I said, never enter into an argument with somebody about the word of God. You can never win. Because once they made up their mind, there's nothing that you can do to change their mind. You know, it's only through the power of God's prayer that somebody will come to faith, just as you did. You didn't know Jesus Christ until you had that encounter. Paul, on the road to Damascus, he was an avid hater of the Christian religion. He did everything to annihilate, to destroy. And then one day, on the road to Damascus, he had this encounter with Jesus that turned him around. You and I cannot bring anybody to faith, only Jesus. It has to be a personal encounter because Jesus speaks the word to you, to me, to everyone individually to bring us you know, to himself. You know, there's no doubt in my mind at all, ladies and gentlemen, about the complementarity, you know, between the Old and the New Testament. It is the same God. And yet people will come up with all kinds of clever, sometimes ingenious excuses and, 
and propositions to actually diffuse that or even to argue against that. Yes. I don't think it's always come up with the ideas. I think it's safe. Oh, obviously. But we allow ourselves to be used by the devil so that we become his agent to actually plan that. Yeah, yeah. even Old Testament, if you go to like a, a Psalm or so many places, right. they're talking about Jesus Christ. Right. All right let's and they're calling Son of God. They saw the Son of God already. So he was already before, mm-hmm. before New Testament. Right. Yeah, so um, he is from the beginning and the end. Right. He is the creator of all. Amen. So, Amen. And another thing I really want to say to my brothers and sisters, because I have seen my Lord Jesus Christ and I, I become a follower of Jesus, mm-hmm. but you, didn't, you don't see, right? So if you want to see our Lord Jesus, this is his word of God. Right. This is him. Right. He Amen. is like walking word of God. Sure. Thank you. Another thing that I want to point out when he talks about Jesus as the light. Well, maybe you haven't lived in a dark place, so this will make an impact on you. I come from a third world country where it gets pretty dark. And you have this little lantern, or I don't know what the name that you call it here, that you hold and you, it only shines up to a little kind of place. And you go to walk in the darkness sometimes, so you don't have it. And so when you have electricity to actually brighten the place and, you know, the darkness dissipates, you know, because light and darkness cannot coexist, you actually begin to understand what really light is all about. And I understand this uh, in a way that uh, Paul uses it in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. You know, Paul makes this point. Let me start from verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. For we proclaim, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. With ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And I will say hallelujah to that. In Jesus Christ, we see the light of God shining. And so Jesus is the light. And so where Jesus comes, that darkness dissipates. It just, you know, it cannot coexist. It cannot live there. And so tonight, when John talks about Jesus as the light, you can understand what he's saying. It is Jesus who brings that light into our lives, into this dark world, a world that he made that was bright, and then something mysterious called sin through the devil enters this world, and it was all chaos, darkness, just darkness. And then Jesus comes, and he brings light. Tonight, if you're walking in darkness, as I do, as we all do, we need that light to shine so that we can see where we're going so that we don't trip and fall, which is what the devil wants to happen to us. Because when we walk in darkness, you don't know what is there. If you live in the two-thirds world, there may be some creature that lying there that you will step on and it will bite you. You need the light to be able to see so you can avoid it. Jesus is the light. In fact, not only is Jesus the one who gives life to all of all those who believe, but Jesus is also the one who came to reveal God. Have you ever seen God? Has anybody physically seen God here? Okay, I can see people, you know, see, no. I have never seen God. And I'm not sure I can see God until the eschaton, at the end when Jesus comes as God and I can, and I can wait to, uh, you know, see our Lord. And I always say to my friends, I said, you know, the, the, the person that I want to see most is Brother Paul. I want to really ask him some, some questions. <laughs> because he has troubled my mind with a whole lot of questions. 
And I want to engage Brother Paul and ask him, Brother Paul, what did you mean by this? You know, he was consumed by this light, so much so that he, you know, wrote you know, for us. So Jesus is the revelation of God. You know, there's a term that philosophers, you know, um, Pastor Jeff, who is an expert, will tell you that, you know, we say God is God's own self-disclosure. Let me say it again. God is God's own self-disclosure. Only God can disclose God. Only God can reveal God. And so it makes sense to say that Jesus, because he's God, he alone can do what? Reveal God to us. Does that make sense? You cannot disclose God. I cannot do that. Nobody can do that. Only God can make himself known. Yes, Sheila. Didn't Jesus say, if you have seen me, you have you've seen, seen the Father. You've seen the Father. Amen. And so you see how these things that we're talking about tonight really make sense. When we talk about God and Jesus, you can see that we're talking about the same you know, person. So when we talk about the triune God, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, it's not a stretch. It is, it is a fact. And yet it is hard for our minds to capture, to comprehend, to fathom, even to conceptualize this. Because it is beyond us. But yeah, he is God. And so only Jesus can reveal God to us. And that is what John says in this you know, prologue. But you see, there's also something here. Jesus is divine. He's God. But there's something that he did. In the incarnation, he took on human form. Another mystery. So that he could identify with me, with you, with all of us. In fact, the writer of Hebrews makes this uh, important point that I think is really important. That, you know, Jesus was God and yet he chose to come and be like us. You have all of that in the notes and you can read about it. And so Jesus is God and he's God's ultimate message to this dying world. In fact, not only is he God, but he created everything. And so let me go to Isaiah chapter 43. Uh, just a, a couple of verses there because I think it's important for us to allow God's word to speak to us. Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 7. And then I'll go to uh, Romans 11 and then also Colossians 1. Very beautiful passages that are really um, uh, very self-explanatory. In Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 7. This is what the prophet Isaiah says. Every one who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. God created all of us and he made us for his glory. Kavod. In fact, Paul puts it so beautifully in Romans chapter 11. Please turn with me to the book of Romans. But you can see that Isaiah, you know, really, uh, in, in Isaiah 43, he really makes this a big theme over there. But in Romans chapter 11, verses 34 to 36, you can read from verse 33 uh, to the end. But let me just read from verse 34 to 36. Romans chapter 11, beginning at verse 40, uh, 34. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given him a gift, uh, given a gift to him that he might be repaid? These rhetorical questions, Paul is trying to drive at something that you cannot gave God anything. In fact, he gave us himself the ultimate gift as we talk about. Now look at verse 36. Beautiful. And look at, you know, when I was learning English in Ghana, you know, we had this parts of speech. You had nouns and adjectives, pronouns, prepositions. And look at how much or how many prepositions are packed here. And prepositions, you know, you know, they relate to the noun and the verb in a very unique way. So look 
and you can count them. For, that's one of them, preposition there. From him, and another one, through him, so for, from him, through him, and another one, and to him, to is another preposition, to him, are all things. To, another one, him, be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So you can see what's going on here. That in Jesus, we actually can see that he made us from him and then through him and then ultimately to him are all things. Jesus, it's God in verity. But what did, did the word come to do? The word came to provide grace and truth. Pastor, yes. one of the things that I think about when Jesus came was to uh, give us uh, information yeah. about God. Yeah. That he taught us to pray. Yeah. God likes us to pray. Yeah. He gave us the Lord's Prayer. Mm -hmm. He talked about in my father's house are many mansions. That's I correct. go to prepare a place for you. Right. So throughout his ministry with his power and his love and his relationships with all people, he also was our educator, That's our correct. instructor. That's correct. To, to bring us into that center part core, if you will. Amen. To understand right. more completely, right. though it's never completely, but to understand more fully right. God. Amen. I know our time is up. I need to close because we have choir, so 725. But you can see the discussion is beginning to open up. And we can go on and on, but hopefully uh, when we come back next week, we can actually continue to do that. Let me just close our time with prayer. Please read through the outline, and there are some questions for discussion that I want you to kind of uh, really uh, just go through. Gracious Lord, we thank you that you are the creator of this world and that you made us for yourself, and that you came again to reveal yourself. God is God's own self-disclosure. Only God can make God known. Thank you, Jesus. And that you came to show us grace and truth. You are grace. You are the truth. Help us to embrace this grace and this truth because we pray in no other name than in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you all for tonight. Thank you, our virtual audience, and we hope to see you all next week.